Without further ado, I'm inviting you to meet Luke Robluski, and he all goes by Luke W, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and he's currently a product director at Google. He has many illustrious roles in his prior life, and I think we probably are familiar with some of his books, Mobile First, Web Form Design, and Sightseeing, A Visual Approach to Web Usability. And if you haven't heard about those, you'll hear about all kinds of fun things tonight anyway, because he's going to tell us about mobile in the future, the future of mobile. Cool. OK. We got this guy on. Hi. Uh, I came to Silicon Valley 2002-ish or so. So I was 16 years ago. And uh, one of the things that I did when I came here, because I didn't know anybody, was actually start coming to Beikai in this here auditorium. I think we had the same projector back then. <laughs> <laughs> Big Bertha, as she's affectionately known. And uh, she has given birth to a little baby projector. <laughs> And it is the little baby projector who is going to entertain us tonight. So thank you, Bertha, and welcome the new, I don't know what she named her, but there she is. Uh, anyway, it was really cool coming to Beikai back in the day. I remember very vividly sitting in the back row, and uh, I think to the right of me was Larry Tesler, and we were watching Marissa Mayer talk about how Google does user experience design, something like 15 years ago. So maybe I'm dating myself, but I'm also kind of putting in a plug. I think a lot of cool stuff happens here. Some of us so enjoy it. Some of you, oh, see. I'm not the only one. The, did I make that up about the projector? Is that a real thing? OK. I believe you. OK, cool. Uh, anyway, I'm not here to talk about the past. I'm here to talk about the ooh future. What happened to that microphone that was here? Somebody, oh, can I use it? Yep. Let me turn it on. I, you turn it back Boom. on. Boom. Oh, OK, it's on. Ready? Just to show you how old school we are today, I'm going to try and get my audio to work with this mic. Here we go. All right, wow. yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. So anyway, uh, starting from there, in order to talk about where we're going, it always helps to step back a little bit. And when I think about kind of the computer industry and computing and the kinds of things that we've been doing over the past, I don't know, 30 something years or so, in my mind, there's three eras of computing, right? The first one is kind of mainframes. And the way I describe the mainframe era is computers take up entire rooms and none of you have one. <laughs> if you're lucky, you may be able to kind of use one for a little bit, but that's pretty much it, right? The era after mainframes is when we had PCs, personal computers. And the way to describe this is now computers actually fit on desks, and some people have one. Probably most of the people in this room have one. But if you look at the planet, most people don't have one. And the current era of computing that we're in is the mobile era of computing. And the best way to describe this is computers now fit in pockets, and pretty much everybody has one. And the mobile era, you could say, kind of kicked off about 10 years ago. Uh, it's as good of a marker as any when the original iPhone was introduced, right? If you really want to get technical, I always have to throw this in in case I talk to Googlers who, well, if it wasn't 10 years ago, actually, it was. Sorry, that's a bad imitation of them. Their, their voice is a little more whiny than that. <laughs> but roughly 10 years ago, we had the introduction of this device, which was framed as trying to leapfrog what was out there at the time. And uh, it's useful to kind of go back 10 years and see what things looked like and see what has happened since then. So if we go back to roughly 2006, 2007 or so, this is what worldwide computer shipments looked like. How many devices that we could characterize as computers made it out into the market on a yearly basis around the world? And you can see for uh, personal computers, PCs, there's a like 240 million a year shipped. There were smartphones back then. There's about 70 million shipped a year in terms of smartphones, but they kind of looked like this. I don't know if you remember these things. They all had the like little ball-y thing in the middle, right? The, I think the Blackberry Pearl 
tried to make it look like a pearl and you <laughs> rotate it around. Uh, sometimes they actually acted like cursors and things like this. Well, this is what the state of smartphones looked like about 10 years ago. And if you trace these lines forward, here's what's happened to personal computer shipments over the past 10-ish or so years. Meh. Right? Not that impressive. Here is the mobile line, which some people point out has plateaued. Right? And like, oh, but it stopped growing. Well, if there's any place to stop growing, it's probably like 1.7 billion things shipped a year. Right? <laughs> it's a pretty good place to plateau. But what you should take away from this is lots of mobile devices in the market, right? And more hitting the planet every single year. And what that leads to is lots of people doing things on mobile. Going back again 10 years, this is our friends over at Facebook and uh, their monthly active users. Back in 2006, they had about 12 million people using the service on the desktop every month. Not that exciting. What happened over 10 years? Also not really that exciting. Until you add the mobile line and you see kind of where they sit now. So all these devices create lots of audiences that are now on these devices, right? Many devices, many people using those devices. And it's not just the um, existing products that benefit from this. It's also new products. So if you go back 10 years and you ask what was the fastest growing application of all time back then, in 2006, anybody have an idea? Netscape, uh, 2006, a little later. You know it, if I say it, you'll all know it. You're like, oh yeah. Skype, correct. Skype was the fastest growing application to that point. Nothing grew as fast as it because it hit 630 days, it hit 40 million users. In fact, Skype was so popular that eBay bought it, then a private equity group bought it, and then Microsoft bought it. So it got bought three times. It's pretty good, right? Show me another startup that can say they got bought three times. <laughs> um, but that's how long 10 years ago. 10 years ago, that's how long it took to hit 40 million users. Last year, we had uh, Super Mario Run, which hit 40 million users in four days just on iOS. And I cheated here. I know the line actually shouldn't even show up, but I had to kind of make it look like something. <laughs> and just for kicks, uh, let's look at this for a second. How long did it take apps to reach 10 million users? So it took Super Mario Run one day to hit 10 million. Anybody have an idea how long it took Pokemon Go? Obviously, Pokemon Go, pretty popular, right? A few hours. A few hours? Okay. Two days, pretty good. Not Mario good, but pretty good. What about Angry Birds Space, which is the fastest growing of all the Angry Birds games? Uh, three days. Google Plus? <laughs> I know, you all laugh. This always happens. This always happens. This is just numbers. I'm not. 16 days for Google Plus. That's pretty good. Which, you know, is why I think there was all hands on deck at our friends in Menlo Park at the time when that happened. Uh, oh, shoot, I gave it away. Twitter, 780 days. What about Facebook? It's a pretty different world, right, in terms of how quickly you can reach audiences. So lots of devices, lots of audiences. Those audiences can grow really darn quickly. But is anybody making money off of this stuff? off of these devices and all these users? Well, if you look again 10 years ago, here's how much annual mobile payment volume happened on PayPal. It was $900,000 only, less than a million. Fast forward 10 years, and it was $155 billion. So people making money off these things as well. And I like this chart because it sort of shows both some of the opportunity and some of the scale. So the biggest shopping day we have in the United States it's called Cyber Monday. You have to say it like that, because at every talk, there's some kind of marketing plant in the audience. And if you don't say it that way, they come out and tackle you, and it's <laughs> kind of awkward. But Cyber Monday, 10 years ago, did about 610 million in one day online sales. That's pretty good, right? 
More than half a billion in one day of online sales. Fast forward again 10 years later, and that number has jumped to about 7 billion in one day. A lot of growth up and to the right. You can see that line kind of accelerating. But if you look at the biggest online shopping day in China, which started around 2009, it's called Singles Day, they did 25 billion in one day. The other interesting thing about this is the amount of sales that happen on mobile in the US on Cyber Monday is about a third, whereas in China on Singles Day, it's 90%. So lots of opportunity in both kind of quadrants here. Anyway, what you should take away from this is lots of devices, lots of audiences, and an opportunity to have a business in that world. But what's most interesting to me is looking at it like this. This is now going from 1985, where personal computers kind of kicked off. And you can see the growth not of how many get sold or shipped per year, but how many are active, how many are currently in use on the planet. And if you look at PCs, it's roughly like 1.3 billion or so active. If you look at smartphones, we're roughly at 3 billion right now, depending on how you measure it. Um, but 3 billion or so active. Mobile devices, as in any kind of mobile device with a subscription, were about 5 billion. And the amount of folks who are over 14 and technically a consumer and can buy and use some of these things is about 5.5 billion out of a population of 7.6 billion today. And so what this tells us is, A, we're dealing with a planet scale kind of phenomenon, right? We're connecting all of the folks on our rock. B, the smartphone line is basically replacing the mobile phone line. And depending, again, where you look, 2023 or so, there'll be 5 billion active smartphones. And the third thing to note is, over the last 10 years, that's pretty crazy change. Right? This is just a decade. And all of a sudden, we have high-powered supercomputers in people's pockets around the globe connected to a real-time network of information, services, data, you name it. We often take for granted just how transformative this stuff has been. And as somebody who makes products for this stuff and has made products for this stuff for a long time, I kind of like to know, well, what have we learned? Tremendous change over these 10 years, and how have we adapted and adjusted what we do when we make software, make apps, make services? And again, to illustrate this, let's go back 10 years to that introduction of the first iPhone. This is the first camera app that shipped on an iPhone, and it effectively had two features. You could take a picture, and you could look at it. And in fact, the look at it is a cheat because I count it because there was a button there, but what it actually did is opened up another app, the gallery app, where you could look at the picture. But since there's a button, I'm going to count it. Two buttons. Not that exciting, is it? Of course, it didn't stop there because after iOS 2 came iOS 3, iOS 4, iOS 5, iOS 6, and iOS 7 with the introduction of flat design. You all know about flat design, right? It's basically you take something that looks three-dimensional and you kind of flatten it out. <laughs> and you know, in general, it does good things for you. <laughs> or so I'm told. So anyway, flat design. But we didn't stop at iOS 7. We did iOS 8, iOS 9, iOS 10. And now the latest version is iOS 11. And if you compare what we were previously able to do with these cameras we carry around in our pockets, now not only can we take photos and view them, but we can take wild assortments of photos. And you can take portrait photos, slow motion videos, time lapse videos, loop bounce and long exposure videos. There's this weird yellow button if you use an iPhone at the top that turns your pictures into like 30 second videos that you accidentally push all the time. And you're like, what the hell happened? Why is it not a picture? It's sort of a weird video. I don't know if you knew about that feature, but it's, it's in there. All right. A lot of things that you can do with this. And some people look at this and they say, wow, well, that is just a perfect example of feature creep. Right? Look at this. It used to be so easy. 
I used to just be like, take a picture, and now I don't, I'm afraid to touch the darn thing because the yellow light goes on or I slap on a filter and I don't know how to undo it and it fuzzes out the background and why is it a square? It used to be a triangle, I don't know. <laughs> Some people feel that way, right? Whereas other people say, no, 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 this is a perfect example of building a minimal viable product at scale, right? People get a skateboard, they like it. Then we give them a scooter, they like it. We give them a bike, they like it. In the car, they like it. And the whole time, they just like it. <laughs> I think this visualization misses kind of the difference between skateboards and cars a little bit, but hey, it's OK. So actually, why don't I ask you, is this uh, feature creep? Is yes. adding stuff? Yes, and. Yes, and? Or is it a great example of MVP? Who says feature creep? Okay, one person. MVP, it's awesome. Everybody should work like this. Okay, who hates raising their hands in little in auditorium things? <laughs> Good. Okay, I know where we stand for the rest of this. <laughs> but what happens when it's not just the camera? What about messaging? Ten years ago again, there was messaging on the original iPhone, but all you could do was send text messages. And I know this is going to scare the living crap out of you, but there were no emojis. Oh. <laughs> this was a world without emojis. It did exist. Now, of course, not only are there emojis, but you can attach pictures. You get like a live feed where you can record a video. You can pick anything in your camera roll. You can uh, search for images and GIFs to send people. You can use it like a walkie-talkie to record audio back and forth. The more you poke around here, the more mysterious things you find. It turns out you can actually like record your heartbeat with a watch and draw over it and send that as a message. <laughs> so you could have like a pum 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 love you. Oh, somebody gets that text message. And they feel it, too. Have you done this? If they get it on their wrist, they actually feel your heartbeat on their wrist. And I'm told that means something. <laughs> if that's not enough for you, you can go and add apps to messaging, right? And they have all these sticker packs and app packs. There's a whole store for messaging stuff. So if one of your friends is working real hard to drink more water, it turns out you can install an app into Messenger to uh, encourage them, this hydration pack here. Right? You can send them a sticker that's like, keep going. <laughs> Almost there. It's just like things drinking water and pictures of water and water bottles. <laughs> what about if you wanted to send one of those pictures you had to people? Yeah. Well, back then you actually could, but again, this is going to seem like a dark, dark time. You could only email them. If you want to get a photo, and some people still do this, by the way, you could only email that photo. Today, if you want to share something, God bless you, right? The assortment of options that you have available to you, if you'd like to send a photograph to a human being, are beyond compare, right? Tons and tons of stuff. And I look at this and I think, uh, you know, A, there's this conversation to be had around things used to be so easy, and now, look at this. Are we empowering people or terrifying people? Is the smartphone now in a state of complexity that it was when the original simplified version of the smartphone came out? Prime for disruption again? Mm, I don't know. When I look at this, though, what I reflect on the most is this is an example of what people who make software do. They add shit. What are we going to do? Let's add something to it. What are we going to add? I don't know. There's a bunch of ideas. OK, let's add it. Let's add another thing. Let's add more stuff. Right? That's one of the main things we do when we make software. We add things to stuff. <coughs> stuff to things. Great example. But we don't just add things to stuff. We do one other thing, which is we redesign stuff. So we add things, we redesign things. Oh, crap, we added too much stuff. Let's redesign it. OK, now let's keep adding more. Great. Now we've added too much stuff. Let's redesign it. And the cycle completes. So if we look, again, 10 years ago at iOS, this was the first calculator app that came with iOS. 
It stayed looking like that for about two years until they redesigned it in iOS 3. And then, of course, they had to redesign it during the flat design era. <laughs> so it's the iOS 7 version. And very recently, it got another overhaul, iOS 11. So every you know, couple years, three or four years or so, they redesign the calculator app. And I have to sort of ask, <laughs> have we gone round and round? Is this an example of circular logic? Or does this add up to a set of well-rounded designs? Is it a calculated move on <laughs> Apple's part? <laughs> I'm a dad. I can go all day on those. So. <laughs> Somebody stop me. <laughs> Let's stop talking about Apple for a second and switch over to Twitter, right? Making an app for Twitter. And, uh, Sometimes you don't have to work at a company to just sort of smell the strategy on what they do, right? You can sort of look at them like, oh yeah, okay. I understand what they're doing. And it comes through a lot when you look at the design of products, right? And so I wasn't at Twitter during these years, but I just have a sneaky suspicion of what some of the th thought processes were that they're going through. And I believe somewhere around 2010, they came to the realization that they need a mobile app. So they bought this app called Tweety, which was kind of popular, and this is what it looked like. And so here we go. This is the Twitter iOS app. Now, they redesigned it, of course. And in 2011, they added some labels. And so you know, there's this common refrain, oh, if only people understood Twitter, more people would use it. right? So how do we make it more understandable? Well, let's like, label things and change the icons a little. Maybe people will understand it then. Uh, then, of course, flat design came around. Notice the theme yet? And then we're like, well, you know, people still don't really understand it. Maybe if we get rid of these weird symbols like the act and the hashtag, then people will get it. Let's call it more normal stuff like messages or notifications. Then maybe people will get it. Then somebody got the idea that, no, 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 people don't understand Twitter because we have a, need a point of view. We are real-time news, so let's add this big moments thing here in the center to emphasize what we're all about. Oh crap, nobody's adding moments. So maybe if we stick it behind this thing that looks like search, then people will go there. So maybe we can be real-time news that way. And then at some point, they're just like, ah, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I kind of have to ask. <laughs> Now, Twitter, pretty much every year, like clockwork, they redesign their mobile app. They change things up, right? That's not how every company operates. If you look instead at Facebook, right, and you compare Twitter's process to Facebook's process, here's how they iterate year over year. On Facebook, this is like some of the mobile app navigation menus that are live right now. And if you really dig deep, I had started a thread on accident where people just started sending me pictures of their screenshots of Facebook. Right? And I had to create like a Google Doc to track them all. And there's like a spreadsheet. And people are entering them. And I counted at least 72 versions of mobile navigation live at this moment for people. All right? And again, I don't work at Facebook. But I think somebody had the idea, you know what? We're going to machine learn the hell out of this navigation. <laughs> Forget about making choices. OK, design team, go make us like 3,000 icons. <laughs> We're going to feed it into this bucket, and it's going to spit out what the nav should be for any random person. <laughs> Different approach, right? Maybe it works for them. I don't know. Uh, let's stop talking about iOS for a second and switch over to Android. This is the first eBay Android app. This is the second eBay Android app. The uh, third eBay Android app, <laughs> the fourth one. And uh, right around here, I think they bought that company, Red Laser. Remember where you like scan the barcodes? Like, oh, yeah, it's going to be huge. We've got to put this here. Uh, nobody used it. You know how I know? Because the fifth version of the eBay app read a red line there. And then the sixth version wrote the word scan and made it big. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And then they kept at it for version 7 and version 8 until finally they gave up. <laughs> now, somewhere around here, search traffic on the eBay Android app started falling. And I think it got lower with this version. It got really low. 
And do you know how I, again, can smell that? Because the next version, there's this giant blue search thing right at the top. All right, so their bearing of the search box wasn't panning out very well for them. Uh, what is this, 12th version, 13th version, 14th version, 15th version, 16th version? And I'm going to pause here because this is a great example of redesigning and adding stuff. It's what we do. This is 10 years of eBay Android app design. And I'm going to pause because I want to ask you a question. How many meetings does this represent? How many emails? How many human lifetimes are represented by this progression of 10 years? It's a lot, right? You all know it's a damn lot because you feel this pain. <laughs> and you know, I'm a huge fan of iteration. I'm sure the 14th version is working way better than the first version. Conversions up, probably a lot of good metrics have gone forward. But like, if you really take a step back, though, what have we been doing for the past 10 years? Moving pixels around? Adding buttons? And the reason why I have to ask this question, because not only do I sort of feel the meetings and the emails when I look at this, it reminds me of something else. And uh, what it reminds me of is 30 years of Adobe Illustrator design. <laughs> and when I look at 30 years of Adobe Illustrator, not 10 years, 30 years of Adobe Illustrator design, what I see is, hey, we added some stuff. And we redesigned some stuff. And I have to ask again, like, are we just taking what we used to do and shoving it on a smaller screen now? And when I say what we used to do, I mean the, not only just the processes, but the stuff we work with. The like clay we mold, the pieces we spend our time interacting with, right? Are we just moving pixels around? And what's going to happen? 20 years from now, when am I going to be like, here's 58 versions of the eBay Android app? <laughs> Is there going to be a blog post about 50 years of Adobe Illustrator design? It's like, OK, here's five more icons. Now they're gray. <laughs> like, this is the type of stuff that personally just kind of keeps me up at light, night. Right? Is this the end all, be all of these processes? Are we so boxed in that we can't see? What else we could be doing? And again, I want to make the point that iteration is good. So I'm going to show you a couple things where I think iteration makes a big difference. And doing this type of design work is worthwhile. It pays off. But then there's kind of a but to it. And uh, let's talk about that for a second. So one of the things I've ranted on and off about for many years is uh, login forms. Right? This is just an example. Username and password fields, it's a blight on not only the world, not only the internet, but the world. Like literally, this causes pain and suffering to human beings on a daily basis in huge numbers. Nobody reports about this, but this is a blight on the planet. CNN should tune in here. And there's lots of reasons this sucks, but one of the reasons is you get onto the small screen, you have your fat french fry eating fingers, you're trying to type a little password that has you know, carrots and tildes and special characters, but not those special characters and uppercase. And when you type, you can't even see what you entered. It's like cruelty on cruelty, right? So you can do things to help human beings get through this. Like for example, Amazon introduced this little feature to show a password. It's just a nicety for humans. When you are typing, you can actually see what you typed and decide whether or not you want to continue. Now, they don't just do it to be nice and help people. They also do it because there's uh, benefits to them from a business perspective. If people have to go through a purchase, if, if they have to go through a password recovery flow when trying to buy something that's in a shopping cart, three fourths of the time they won't buy the thing that's in their shopping cart. So this is losing them money, so they care. And if you put little like show password things, there's data that shows you will actually help people log in. They'll be more successful. Right? So you bring these numbers down. And the reason why you bring these numbers down, if you look at how people interact with this stuff, they actually tap on these fields. 
Right? So they tap these controls, and they generally do it once they realize they're getting the dots. So after the first character, about 88% of people, that's when they go and hit tap, and three-fourths of the people go and say, oh, please show me the password. So a lot of people will make use of a feature like this. It's useful, helps humans, helps businesses. It's good. It's good iteration to try and fix this stuff. And Amazon and other companies have invested a lot of time and effort in this. They went from you can't view your password on mobile to you can tap to see it, to it's revealed by default, you can tap to hide it, to they show it to you when you type below and you can choose to toggle it, but they still keep the dots to make you feel like it's secure. So a lot of iteration, right? Clearly they care about this and they spend time and effort getting this done. But are we just doing our damn best to make a really crappy thing semi-okay? On mobile? Because after all this iteration, Amazon went and launched this thing where you don't even have to type in a password. You just put your thumb on the screen. Right? And without this, I view this as like a divergence, right? So there's this tweak, 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 move pixels around, and then go off in this direction. And what I'm really interested in is how do you make that divergence? How do you get away from this rut of this 10 years of eBay Android app redesign, 30 years of Adobe Illustrator redesign, to make that flip? And I'm going to show you one other reason why I care. And I sort of said usernames and passwords are a blight on humanity. And I genuinely believe this. This is the screen for a bank account I have overseas. My grandmother was really sick overseas. I had to like pay doctors to take care of her. So I set up a bank account overseas, right? So I could pay her bills and the like. This is the login screen that keeps me from the money that is keeping my grandmother alive. Okay, just to put it in like plain terms. And this is the text written on this screen. Enter randomly chosen by the system from your password characters into an empty unmarked fields. Yeah! All right. What is this monstrosity? Worst of all, you try to figure it out, you fail three times, and they're like, you're locked out. You can come into a branch and we'll reset your password for you. In the foreign country. I'm in the US. Oh, well, you can uh, get a notarized form that says you'd like to reset your password and send it over to us via mail. And then we'll let you back into your account. True story. And then they did that. And then I came back to the screen. I still couldn't freaking figure it out. So I want to contrast this with this. You want to unlock your phone? Just look at it. Oh, hey, we know it's you. You're cool. Enter randomly chosen by the system from your password characters into an empty unmarked fields? <laughs> or just look at your phone? Which side do we fall on here? And some people say, oh, I can't believe that exists. Let me show you a whole bunch of banks around the world that hold your money via Sudoku puzzles. <laughs> How does this happen? Does anybody think this is a good idea? Mm -hmm. How does this happen? Somebody, does. Somebody freaking did it, and then other people are like, oh, best practices analysis, competitive, competitive analysis. I'm going to print out the screenshots of like 10 different login forms, and look, everybody's doing this, so that's what's going to end up in my mock-up. I'm being trite and ridiculous, but I really freaking care about this, right? This is how a lot of these decisions get made. And people just don't think about whether it's a good or bad idea. We look at what other people are doing, and we just implement it. Another thing that we care about, that I've been talking about a bunch of times, is like, check out. I have something I'd like to buy. You have something you'd like to sell me. Pretty fundamental underpinning of the economy, right? Not even talking about the digital economy. And of course, people have taken this process of being able to buy stuff and moved it over to mobile. In fact, they have moved all of it over to mobile. <laughs> right? <laughs> Including, where's my favorite, fax? 
Home fax number? No, they don't have it. <laughs> oh, there it is, daytime fax number, right. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Let me f <laughs> Now, there's a bunch of reasons this is suboptimal, minus the daytime fax number inclusion. But when you see something like this, what do you think? Kind of like, ugh. I mean, I see this, I'm like, well, there goes my day. It was going pretty good. Had my coffee, and then I was going to fly somewhere, and ah, oh, crap. Whereas something like this, you're like, oh, you know what? I bet I could do that. That doesn't seem so bad. So there's these issues of perception where if you take the time, and by the way, all the same questions here are here, minus this country of residence, which I don't know why they ask. But like, this is really just a question of spending time doing good design work. Right? And it changes the dynamic. Not only does it change the dynamic, but you can actually see quantifiable benefits. When you test the two things, conversion rates are higher, improved interaction times, less time spent. All this good stuff happens when you take the time to implement something like that versus what you have there. And in fact, you can go pretty far here. This is Staples. It used to be 22 inputs to buy something on mobile. They got it down to five. Right? And they're using a lot of good practices here. So uh, they just don't split input fields. They just ask you your name, as opposed to forcing you to succumb to the whims of a database. But, but, but we store names as first name, last name in the database, so. <laughs> <laughs> the beta database made me do it, right? It's like, yeah. Sorry, it's like, it's, it has, it has a name value pair. I can't. Uh, addresses, rather than having you fill all this stuff in, we can use the Google Places API. You type a couple characters and you fill all that stuff in. Uh, we can use similar inline validation to make sure you provide good contact info, cut down on those 15% uh, of hard bounces for email where you can't contact people. This will drop that number by half for sure. And then uh, we use inline validation for input masks to capture credit card payment in a single input field. You can scan credit card. We use smart defaults. And within five input fields, we can get you to buy something instead of 23 things. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? I mentioned a bunch of them. And of course, the impacts are good. More people will start. That's that perception thing. It'll take them less time, less clicks, conversion rates go up, all this good stuff happens. So all this iteration is worth it, right? It pays off. This is good work. But again, we're back to taking a paradigm we had before and doing our damn best to make it work OK on these screens, right? And it's a lot of effort. And you can go even further. So here's our friends at Amazon. If you want to buy this little turtle tank, right? You just hit the Buy Now button. Up slides this little thing. You just sort of slide across. And within a day, the little turtle shows up at your house. And there's good things about this too, right? Accounting for one-handed use. You're seeing a lot of mobile design now actually dealing with how people hold and use devices, whereas before they just sort of tried to make desktop layouts fit on mobile. Uh, and a big driver for this is back in 2014, only about 7% of smartphones that are active had about five and a half to six inch screens. Now that number is over 40%. So it makes it hard to get your thumbs up to the top of the screen and all those other good things, right? And again, we can look at this and we can say, you know, what are we really iterating toward? Is the goal here to make this existing notion of what checkout is as good as possible? Or are we trying to make something that's a bit more mobile centric? Hit a button, slide your thumb because you're holding the phone like this. Or can we go even further? So what else Amazon is doing with getting people to buy? Because that's their, kind of their whole thing, right? Get you to buy stuff. They also have this weird little button thing, which you've probably seen, called the Amazon Dash button. And when you first see this, it doesn't look that impressive, or maybe it even isn't that impressive. But the idea is pretty interesting, which is, where do you find out you need more laundry detergent? When you're doing laundry. So you just stick it on your laundry machine. You find out you need more. You just hit that button. It shows up. That's it. It sits there where you need it. You tap it once, and ta-da. It's just like another button on the washing machine. I like start. Give me more detergent. Shows up the next day. 
So compare this little interaction again to that mobile checkout flow I showed you with the daytime fax number. And Amazon's doing more of these things here. They have this store called Amazon Go, and as you can probably guess, I love this tagline, no lines, no checkout. Pretty interesting concept. The way it works is you just sort of walk in and uh, you have a little QR code on your mobile app. You point it at the scanner when you come in, and then you walk around, you look for things you want. Good, take, we'll eat, walk out. <laughs> And that's it, right? Once you get over your feelings of being a thief, and you <laughs> <laughs> but that's you know societal norms working against us. And you know, grab a bunch of things, take what you want, walk out, no checkout, no lines, nothing. So I was in Seattle recently. They have one of these over there, and ironically, there was a line, but it was a line to get in. <laughs> right? So I was like waiting in the line to go into the store to be in the lineless <laughs> store. But that's me, here's the little app, there's the QR code, and sure enough, I went in there, I put the little QR code down on the thing, I walked into the store, I grabbed the drink, I grabbed the snack bar, and I just walked out. It was exactly like, sometimes these videos are BS, it was exactly like that video. I was like, yeah, walked out. I don't look as good as that guy, but. <laughs> and then, as I left, it just gave me a little boop, here's the snack and the water you got. And they actually had a nice little animation that shows if they got something wrong, you can kind of change it, adjust it. But it was like pretty spotless, right? Came in, took what I wanted, left. Now, behind the scenes, to make it that seamless, like the experience I had and the dude had, um, there's a lot going on. All right, so if we look at what's really happening here, here's how Amazon Go, the store, works. You come in, you scan this QR code, sensor I says, okay, that's Luke, right? or at least it says this account. And then what they do is they have cameras around where they can sort of say, okay, this blob of person or this shape or these colors or whatever is associated with that account. And there's cameras that sort of see when you pick stuff up and see what you've picked up and whether or not you've kept it, right? They will grab some pictures to make sure that they can tell you later that you took this. There's microphones all over the place that point the cameras places. There's pressure, load, infrared, all kinds of sensors everywhere to know what's where and what isn't where. And uh, all of these cameras, all of these microphones, and all these sensors effectively give them a real-time map of everyone, everything in the store at any given time. Now, that's a huge ream of data that's coming at them at any given point in time. And so they have to have pretty complicated systems that go and deal with all the signal and noise ratio and all this stuff. So there's a lot of machine learning, looking at patterns, what's a real item purchase, what's a real person. They're doing motion detection, a whole bunch of stuff, right? I picture it looks something like that. <laughs> complicated thing. A lot of technology, right? Not only the hardware, but also the software that makes sense of all that hardware. But all of this complicated stuff goes over here, right? All this technical complexity, when you go in the store, you don't have to think about any of that. Because you just go and take a sandwich and walk out. And to me, this is the money slide. This basically epitomizes the whole job, the whole sort of goal of making software and technology help people. The only way we make that happen is if we take all of this on ourselves, make this our problem, so people can just do what they normally do. Right? This is why I rail so hard against things like, uh, you know, being, oh, the database has this structure. You know what? You're copping out. Right? Instead of taking the hard work to figure out, well, how would a human actually represent that information? How can I talk to them like a normal person? Like, oh no, a machine made me do it. Right? Coming back to this thing for half a second, this is a really complicated little product. It doesn't seem like it on the surface, but when you hit that button, it connects to your local area network. Right? It sends data down those pipes to Amazon that says, here's the order. Then there's a billing system that kicks in that detects fraud, that moves money in real time. There's a global delivery network 
that then associates that payment to that object, which is in some warehouse somewhere, finds the closest warehouse, somebody goes and gets it, puts it in the truck, it shows up at your house. Super complicated. And all you have to do is like, <laughs> right? Sticking with this theme for a second, a lot of people have been really praising Apple's AirPods. And I think one of the big reasons why this is such a nice experience and people have been giving it so many kudos as a kind of well-designed product is how do you make the connection between your headphones and your phone using AirPods? You just open the box. It connects it. That's it. You open it up, it's like, hey, connected to this phone. Have you ever tried to like Bluetooth connect something? <laughs> right? As I open the settings app, find the network, fifth the curry key B C D, wait for connection, look at device, find pairing code 45D, enter pairing code 45D. What the hell is that? <laughs> it's exactly what I was talking about earlier. It's taking all this technical complexity and shoving it in front of people and being like, you deal with it. Right? Versus this, they had to build their own custom chip to make this happen, or maybe some kind of chip thing. I don't know. And they put a hell of a lot of work, so all you have to do is just open the box. You want to play music? Just put it in your ear. You want the music to stop? Take it out of your ear. You want them to charge up? Put them in back inside the little case. There's like literally no interface here. There's no buttons, there's no knobs, there's no dials, there's no little scroll bars, right? There's no input fields. Here's another example. If you are trying to get an answer to a question, what do you do? You ask somebody, right? You say, hey, can you help me with this? That's exactly how this product works. You basically ask it a question like, hey Google, what's the name of the villain in the Professor Poopy Pants movie? <laughs> Something diarrhea, pee pee pants, Epstein, I can't remember, Esquire III. But it will tell you. And I like all these examples together because I feel like all these are examples of technology bending to people, right? As opposed to people bending to technology. And the reason why I like pulling them all together is I feel like we're now actually at a point where these things are starting to become real. Where we actually have the technical prowess, the capability to do human-like things with computers instead of forcing people to do computer-like things with computers. But these things ship today, you can use them right now, and they're getting, but they're not perfect by any means. But the principle is really awesome. Right? And I think the simplest way to sort of articulate the difference here, Bill Buxton has this phrase, natural user interfaces, as compared to graphical user interfaces, which basically take this lifetime of learning that you've had throughout your life and try to use that to generate the interface. How do you get things in the real world? You just take them. How do you recognize whether or not you should give that person $10? You look at them, oh yeah, I owe you $10, here's the $10. How do you get an answer to a question? You ask it out loud. And I think these types of experiences can be a really great, what I would call, North Star, right? Something that helps us figure out where we could be going. As an example, let me just come back to this for a second. Actually, I haven't talked about this, but I will for a second. Snapchat has these glasses, right, where you tap them and they record what you're seeing. And by the way, I think one of the reasons why there's so much infatuation with augmented reality and virtual reality these days is because our eyes are so powerful and they're such a huge input mechanism. Right? And so it's like, well, how can we make that even better through the things that computers can do that our eyes can't do? And one of the things that our eyes are bad at is they don't really remember stuff very well deeply. Right? So here you just tap once, it records a tech second video of exactly what you've seen. So it sort of makes your eyes a bit better. But let's say you record something interesting on these glasses and then you want to send it to somebody. Well, you gotta take out your phone, find the Snapchat app, tap the app, it opens the app, and then you have to tap this thing called memories where then you will be able to tap this thing called specs. And because it's Snapchat, you have to do this like anti-parent double tap dance, <laughs> which is, created to make sure no adult could actually find what you're really sending between friends. And so you like long press, go like this, and then it opens up the sharing menu. 
And then once you're actually in there, you also have to double swipe, long press, and then you can finally send that video to a human. And when I got these glasses, I was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. I just pressed this button. It records everything I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, crap. This is like the exact opposite, right? And why is there such a contrast between the simplicity of the hardware and the pain of the software? And I think it stems from you know, the way we've been making these things. Because when we go and make something like this, especially when we have big screens, it's like, oh, should we add this thing? Yeah, why not? Just squeeze it right underneath there. Yeah, OK, let me kind of shuffle it around. OK, looks OK. Oh, crap, we got to add more. Redesign time. OK, good. OK, add this. OK, looks good again. And so there's this mindset that we just add stuff and kind of arrange the buttons OK, and we're done. And that is what software and product design is. Like, add a thing, move things around to look OK, move on to the next thing to add. Whereas when you deal with stuff like mobile, right, there's, a, I think, a harder job. And again, I don't mean to trivialize design like of software and websites, because I did it for years. And I still do it. But I think there's just a little bit of a higher bar when you're dealing with the realities of mobile devices. And I really appreciate that. For example, here's a, an illustration of this. If somebody sends you a message, what's your address? There is actually a subset of information or a series of actions that you can put here that are very helpful in that specific situation. What's your address? Here's my work address. Here's my home address. And the hard part is knowing what is the right time and place to surface these actions. You have to make these decisions. You actually have to understand workflows. You have to understand the scenarios. And that's hard. That's a lot harder than being like, here's everything we do. You pick, right? That's an easier process, I contend, because I've done it a bunch. So here's everything. I kind of, oh, I'll shove all this behind this little three-dot menu, and this behind the three-line menu, <coughs> and you're done. Another example, on the Android side, somebody sends you text you to understand. We pop up this little translate button, and right there in context, you can hear that. You can do a translation. You can read it. You can respond back. Right? So it's this right time and place. And when I start talking about examples like this, what I always hear from people is like, yeah, well, that works for a simple thing, but I work on complex thing. <laughs> so I can't really do that. And my response is everything's freaking complicated, right? Eating is complicated. Do you know how complicated eating is? When you put food in your mouth, do you have any idea all the crazy processes that go through to turn it into nourishment, energy, and poop? It's crazy complicated. But what do you do as a human? You just go. Right? So I fully believe things are complicated. But that doesn't mean the interaction with those complicated things has to be complicated. Right? And at the very least, even if you can't get it to be that simple, can't hurt to try. Right? Can't hurt to work as hard as you possibly can to get it to be that simple. Maybe you'll learn some things along the way. Maybe you'll find an easier way of doing stuff. Maybe you'll challenge some things that, frankly, have just sat around there and everybody's been copying for a while. And the reason why I think it's really important to push hard, if you look at the reality of how people use mobile devices, mobile devices are lots of short, bursty sessions, as opposed to other form factors where they're kind of longer, more sustained sessions. In fact, Apple's official number for how often people unlock their iPhones is about 80 times a day. Android numbers are a little bit different depending on where you look. But we can say roughly 70, 80 times a day, people are unlocking and looking at their screen. Average eight hours of sleep, roughly, worldwide, it's something like 8.3. In the US, it's 8.8. .8. But you can say every 12 waking minutes or so, there's an unlock somewhere there. Right? It's not all at once, but for every 12 waking minutes, somebody's staring at their phone. That's a lot of times staring at your phone. Not only that, when you look at how long people stare at it, most of the sessions are quite short. Over half of them are for 30 seconds or less. So you're looking at this thing you know, every 12 minutes, 80, 80 times a day. Most of the times, it's less than 30 seconds. You know what's going to really suck? Sitting around and waiting for stuff to load. And people hate 
waiting for things on mobile. They hate it more than encountering unplayable videos <laughs> by a lot. <coughs> and encountering unplayable videos sucks pretty bad, right? Look at how much worse it sucks for slow things. There was a study done by Erickson where they looked at what causes stress, right? And they measured it by how much cognitive load situations create. Turns out waiting in line at a retail store causes stress. So good job, Amazon. No lines, no checkout. They're onto something here. Watching a melodramatic TV show, pretty stressful. Will she marry him? I don't know. No. And here's a dragon, oh crap, like that sort of TV show. Uh, standing at the edge of a virtual cliff. <laughs> I think they include this because VR is a thing, so it turns out pretty stressful. Now, the next one is intended to stress you out, watching a horror movie. If this wasn't stressful, then people making horror movies would not be doing a very good job. Right? But pretty stressful. Watch a horror movie, you're stressed out. What is more stressful than watching a horror movie? Mobile delays. <laughs> and at first you think, that's impossible. But then you think, 80 times a day, right? for an average of 30 times a day, how many times are you hit with that? And the reason why I really believe in this study, because the only thing more stressful than experiencing mobile delays was solving a math problem. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that's legit, right? This is real data, I can believe. So this is why I think it's important to really try. We don't paint the context, the human context around these devices enough. Right? When you think about the scale that we're operating at here, I'm just going to remind you of some of the numbers I showed at the beginning. We have 3 billion of these things active on a planet of about 7.6 billion people. Those 3 billion people, right, half of our population, are looking at this thing almost every 12 waking minutes. And they're doing so for 30 seconds or less. Think about just the scale of impact that you have there. So if you make something a little bit better, And uh, there is one place, actually, where things are even more intense. This is a different study that found similar kinds of things. Here we're looking at average interaction time. And what they did is they pinned cameras on people and watched what devices they looked at. And they found here, last time I said more than half the sessions are about 30 seconds or less. Here they found the average time was about 40 seconds, so pretty similar. Uh, but they also looked at people looking at smartwatches. And if they think it's bad on the smartphone, the average time people looked at a smartwatch was only about seven seconds. And so designing for this kind of environment is almost more extreme than designing for this environment. And so I'm just really interested in seeing like, how do they adapt products to make them work in this sort of space. Before, in the Apple uh, Workouts app, you had to explicitly like, save a workout or discard a workout. Now they just do the work for you. Done. Saved. You can get rid of it later if you want. Right? No need to tap a button or anything. You just look at it. It's done. Uh, another example. Before, they just kind of gave you all the buttons in one order and all the same size. Now, when you do workouts, what it actually does is learn from you and says, oh, last time you did outdoor run, so I'm going to make that first and big and show you what you did. So the interface kind of changes based on how you use it. Uh, and this one is actually my favorite example, which seems sort of trivial, but I really like the ability to use what the, the, the palette that these types of devices now offer you. And I use the word palette. When I think about the palette of the web, you have like links, images, right, texts. Those are the things you can paint with. When I think about some of these technologies, you have different types of things you can paint with. For example, you have this haptic engine, which does things like tap people. That's now in your palette. And so what happens with this, you get a little tap, feels like this, and you tilt the phone like this, and up pops something that tells you, hey, there's a satellite nearby. And the thing that allows you to paint like that is an accelerometer, which tracks the motion of the device. So you just go like this, and the screen turns on, and that notification shows up right there. So it's like, whoosh. so far, that's all that's happened. There's a magnetometer, digital compass, which sort of knows the direction you're facing and can point to, hey, 
you're over here, you should be looking over here. And because there's GPS, which is another thing we can paint with, we can actually put you on a map and tell you exactly where the satellite is based on where you're looking. So with just a little tap, move, oh. We can alert you to the fact that there's an object in space moving past you at precisely that moment in time. And I, I love that this seems trivial and that most people are like, so what? Right? Because when I actually think about all the things that enable this to be possible, it's pretty, pretty freaking amazing, right? And so there's things that we can learn from this seven second thing. Do the work yourself, learn from past behavior, and especially making use of this additional palette of stuff. Right? Because when we start thinking about the capabilities that we have now, then we can go from a world where we have sign out and login, but maybe we don't even need those traditional mechanisms for login anymore. Can we do login without the login form? That's pretty exciting. This is very exciting for me, right? What about, can we do checkout without the checkout form? Or maybe it ends up looking something like this. I don't know. These natural user interfaces, I, I see them popping up more and more. It's very encouraging. If you've ever uh, driven a Tesla, what you do is you walk up to the car, and if the key's in your back pocket or your pocket or your backpack, whatever, it doesn't matter. You just sort of walk up to it, and the handle slides open. It's like, hey, right, literally right as you walk up, handle slides out. You just open it and go in. Hi, boss. Right? Versus, you know what you do with most other cars? Like, find the key, and you go, beep, beep, and the car's like, doot, doot. you have to like, communicate in its language. Doot, 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 doot. OK. <laughs> <laughs> we cool? We cool. OK. Doot, doot. Doot, doot. But that's only the front seat. It's only the front seat. Actually, it works on all sides. Nice example, though, right? Again, changing sort of the dynamic. Here's another example, the uh, iPad Pro. If you tap the screen with a pencil, what it'll do is open up the Notes app to where you last left off. None of this slide to unlock, find the app, tap the app, find the doc, open the doc. You just sort of touch it, and it comes back to exactly where you left off, which, by the way, is how paper works. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but this is what I'm kind of getting at, this natural user interface sort of modality. You just do what you know how to do, and the technology bends to you. Right? The goal here is to take all this technical complexity as a burden on yourself. Do your best to do all this heavy lifting and the complicated things that we technically should be good at so people don't have to deal with it. Because frankly, how many doodads, noob knobs, widgets, gizmos can the average human being deal with? Not a heck of a lot. There should be a group of people, right? There should be a class of citizens whose job it is to help people deal with these things. Right? People don't have infinite amounts of time and opportunity to be spent learning the things. If only we had well-informed, trained, and educated people who make it their profession, their business, their calling to help people get the benefits of all this stuff without incurring the pain of this stuff. Who could possibly do that? This is one of my favorite authors, Bruce Sterling. He used to be a science fiction author. He turned into a design professor. You know, He says, designers, who else is there? But I put designers in quotes because, frankly, Many people have impact on the design of things, whether or not they call themselves designers. Right? They can adopt the same type of mindset. In fact, it would be awesome if the lawyers on your teams adopted this mindset. It would be fantastic. And certainly, the engineers on our teams need to adopt this mindset, because a lot of the work falls on the people who are actually building this stuff. Right? So I don't think this is exclusive to designers, but I really do believe in this kind of mindset of we are going to help you be humans, and we're going to do the stuff that's hard as opposed to making you learn what a computer forces you to do. So in summary, that's my thing. And I, I will be the first to acknowledge, well, actually, let me say that in a second. So I think there's this huge opportunity. Hopefully, I stress that with the number of devices, the large audiences, the money that can be made here. Right? This is planet-scale opportunity and planet-scale impact. 
So there's a real strong kind of impetus to do the right thing, whether it's for business or just for human beings. And of course, we can do a lot to optimize for today. We can talk for hours, or I can talk for hours, about how to optimize a checkout form, or how to deal with things like entering a password and all that. Every kind of core interaction, we've done a lot of work on and have made better. And that's good. Right? Lots of those interaction improvements make sense. But to avoid the 10 years of eBay Android app, 30 years of Adobe Illustrator being the only thing we do, I don't think we should just stop there. I think we can go further. And so this is why I'm so excited about some of these natural user interface things actually coming to fruition. Because I was going to say earlier, I'm the first to acknowledge these aren't the idea of no interface or invisible interface has been around for a really long time, right? People have talked about that stuff forever. I don't think that's the part that's exciting here. I think the part that's exciting is I can now point to practical examples where people have done the hard work to make some of this stuff happen. And not only as demos and as like niche products, but as massive consumer products that millions or hundreds of millions of people now have in their hands. Right? And that's kind of a really big change. So that's all I got. Thanks. for questions, and Ted is going to throw the microphone to you, or I'll walk over. Just, um, you're talking to it this way, but turn towards the floor when you're not talking, because they seem to have feedback. Great. Hello. Hey, Luke. Uh, Hi. Very inspirational. Loved your talk. What are your thoughts on uh, augmented reality and virtual reality? Could that seem such an exciting m medium to design for, and it's so rich and yeah. overwhelming at the same yeah, time. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I don't know if we'll figure it out. Uh, I think there's a lot of pieces in place, and you can start to see it, but I don't know. There's also a lot of very hard problems. Uh, like Some of the biggest problems are, what's the form factor? There's lots of problems with putting it on a smartphone, which is sort of where it exists now, and lots of problems with putting it on glasses, where it doesn't exist, but everybody seems to think it should exist. So I'm optimistic. I, th I genuinely believe in what I was saying before, like the notion of humane augmentation of kind of this part of your brain, which is taking in all this information. How can we make it better? It sounds super exciting to me, but I don't know if there's an answer there yet. It's a cop. I have a, you know what? I have a cool slide on that. Can I show my cool slide? Please. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, now that I said it's cool, you're going to bet that's <laughs> that is not a cool slide, dude. How pretty, cool pretty, pretty is boring it? Boring slide. Uh, my, my friend Tom Chi made this diagram a long time ago. I still use it. 2008. Look at that. But he sort of laid out what a typical product life cycle is for things, right? There's this emergent stage where there's lots of people working on it. Nobody's really gotten it yet. And then there's a stage where people are growing. And at the end of the day, you know, a couple emerge victorious. Most of them will fade away. Then there's this mature stage where you don't really switch because the market's done and something blows up and it goes down. And so if I were to plot out kind of where things are right now, um, it feels like in mobile, we're in this mature market stage. Basically, iOS and Android 1 is not really any story there. And if you're an Android person, you pretty much stay an Android person if you're an iOS person. So like, that's kind of where that sits. If you look at desktops and laptops, pretty much a declining market for a number of years now, right? If you look at voice computers, a lot of growth right here. Also a lot of consolidation, same with like wrist computers, but this really in that fuzzy stage. And uh, I think there's you know, a number of things that people have tried. Is it VR? Is it AR? Is it some other type of thing? We don't know yet. Okay. Where do you see the crossover with accessibility and the mobile market? For instance, as an example, I'm dyslexic on my laptop. I use a dyslexia font yeah. so I can read, but I can't install that on my iPhone. Yeah. So where is the crossover for, because we have vision 
we can make it bigger, yeah. but there are other accessibility issues out there. Yeah, I think they're gradually getting tackled um, as we go, right? Like, if you look at the progress that we've been making to use some of those sensors and technologies to make assistive technologies better, it keeps getting better and better year over year. Is it a solved problem yet? No, but it's not a solved problem on desktops and laptops either. Yeah, it's a problem that's being worked on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think even just to sort of represent some of the things that Google was showing today, there was a video where they implemented Morse code uh, inside of Gboard, so people could yep. use that. Mm -hmm. This video of a woman, I remember. Tanya. Yeah. Tanya. I tweeted this one. Oh, you saw that one. Yeah, yeah. she uses her head like this For to the sort of communicate, right? And so she uses Morse code, and they actually worked with her to enable Morse code inside of Gboard so she could use that as an input mechanism. So I think people are doing good work there, but there's probably more to do. Uh, I had a question here. Uh, yeah. So with uh, natural user interfaces, uh, it seems like there is an implication of uh, seamlessness overall in the in the entire workflow. Uh, so in such cases, uh, should we still expect like a reasonable degree of privacy? Uh, because with so many sensors tracking so many things, should is privacy a concept that will be passe by the time it uh, we come to that? Uh, I think there is, let me, I have a slide for that. <laughs> the problem with my slides is I probably have a slide, but I just don't know where it is in this 700 freaking page slide deck. Uh, okay, sorry, wrong deck. One second. Do, 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 do. It's a long slide, so it's in my long slide deck <laughs> as opposed to my regular deck. Oh, yeah, so here, here we go. So, like, if you look at the types of things we use to secure your bank account, like a PIN, you know, four digit PIN basically has like 10,000 permutations. Yeah. Not really that secure. Uh, typical passwords do letters and symbols and have sort of a minimum requirement of characters. So, you can really kind of protect against uh, what you might call it. Brute, yeah, brute force attacks. If you use a gesture-based kind of system where you draw, and in this case, Windows 10 used images, you can see we can really blow up that permutation, right? The fingerprint tracking or unlocking system that Apple implemented had a bit, about a one in 50,000 chance of somebody unlocking your phone with their fingerprint, assuming they had it and it worked. Whereas the kind of natural user interface thing here using Face ID has a one in a million chance of somebody unlocking your phone unless they're your uh, twin. Right, so I show this to say there are ways to make things more humane and natural that still have security and privacy and things like this baked in. The two are not mutually exclusive. In many cases, they can actually work together, create a, something that's better on both sides. Right? Yep. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Oh, in terms of privacy, how does the privacy? I think it's the same answer, just a different kind of vertical, right? You're going to find certain things that make it more private and certain things that make it less private. Just no, like you find things that are more secure, less secure, independent of whether it's a GUI or a, or a NUI. Like, there's nothing inherent in a natural user interface. I think that makes it less private. Okay. Hi. Here. Uh, uh, Thank you, Luke, for your presentation. It was amazing. Uh, there is something that Hal Varian, the chief of economy of Google, he said that is really amazing it's about like the tech knowledge it comes in waves, mm -hmm. and like we are seeing the VR thing now, but VR is something old, and we, it's coming like really big now. And those waves, as you showed us, they're coming like more closely and together. And I work in that conversation of uh, bot agency in Brazil and we are struggling to hire designers to work with us and I feel like with the new natural user interfaces showing up it's going to be hard to find educated people for that so my question is like what are your thoughts on like the new kinds of designers that or the new kinds of the educations that the design should look for it and what are the things that we as like students I'm not a student anymore, but like I like to study. So what are the new things that we should look for it for the next, I don't know, 10 years, I guess? Uh, 
So, A, if I could predict the future, I probably wouldn't be standing here right now. I'd be <laughs> working on it, right? Nothing against all of you, but. <laughs> so I don't know what the next big thing is, necessarily. I do think following kind of general broad trends is better than jumping onto every next uh, important, you know, like popular thing. You mentioned chatbots. I remember a little while ago, I was like, chatbots are gonna be the future, and now, Anybody really talking about it? I mean, not so much. That doesn't mean it won't be a thing, but usually things go in these waves where it's like, okay, now let's really figure out what's going on, and that's a slow road. Um, it reminds me of uh, something I read yesterday where somebody asked, or Jeff Bezos was quoting what he asked Warren Buffett, and what he asked Warren Buffett was like, your investment thesis is so simple. So you, you say it out loud, you tell people what you're doing, it's so easy. Why don't more people do what you do? And he said, nobody wants to get rich slowly. And I think it's the same thing in terms of like learning. Everybody's always interested in what's the hot new thing, as opposed to really baking in the core concepts and ideas and things that will make their you know, long-term success more viable. I don't know, did that analogy work at all? It did, kind of? Okay. Sorry, first time. Yeah. Uh, does anyone hear me? I don't, okay, all right. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for this interesting talk. Um, I completely agree with your uh, take on, you know, technology should help us and not the other way around. Um, however, your example with the Amazon Dash button, we kind of lose awareness of what is going on uh, after we push the button, so we lose awareness. Do you think this is potentially dangerous? Uh, why do you say that? The, I mean, I think the reason uh, why I'm asking that is... I mean, why do you think we lose awareness after we... Well, I, I'm, I'm maybe thinking of someone who, you know, doesn't really think of what is happening, that, you know, my parents' credit card get uh, affected by it or anything like that. Do you think there's... I'm just trying to ask... Is there maybe a, a line where we should not try to make things as smooth as possible? Uh, I think there is a gradual path to change, which helps make things more possible, right? Very radical ideas tend to bounce off first and then gradually come to fruition. But if you ask me personally whether the high-level goal of making people's lives easier something we shouldn't do at all times? I would say no, that's absolutely what we should be doing at all times, right? And we may step over a little bit and go too far and there may be a learning period, but like, again, long term, I think it's the right thing to do, right? Um, I couldn't justify telling people to keep making usernames and passwords with little dots for all of their software just because that's how we do it now, like I, right? Um, yeah, and the other way, the other point is <clears throat> to come back to your expectations question, which is what I was asking. If I go back through my experience with the Amazon Go store, I went in there, I took things, and it felt a little weird, but then I got a ping that says, here's what you bought. By the way, if we got it wrong, all you have to do is swipe across, we'll get rid of it. So they make affordances to help build comfort and make you feel like you can kind of make the leap with them. And that's part of the design. Like that's an intentional part of the product design to make you feel comfortable with the process. And gradually over time, you're like, yeah, this is how it should work. All right. Yep. Um, mobile first is a good idea. Uh, responsive design is a good idea. Um, together, we often seem to be winding up with mobile only design, mm -hmm. where uh, where people design for a cell phone. Period and then just puff it up big to desktop, which is fine if it's only going to be used primarily on mobile. But um, uh, every office that I've ever been in, everybody's using a desktop. I never go into an office and see people doing their work on a cell phone. And it seems like in that particular case anyway, where people really are doing their work mostly on some desktop monitor, that a mobile only approach um, 
uh, does a disservice to the people who are not using a mobile device. Um, have you uh, given any thought to how mobile first may have gotten kind of perverted into a mobile only concept? I, I think it all boils down to knowing who you're making things for, right? And there are certain programs that we look specific tasks that require different types of tools and are not well suited by the capabilities of mobile devices. But then there, the converse is also true. There's a whole bunch of like desktop tools which are not well suited to the majority of people that are on mobile. Right? In both cases, you sort of need to be aware of that and design accordingly. That said, I, I still, based at least what I see, I still think the access is tilted the opposite way. I mean, I kind of fundamentally believe this and feel like I know it, right? Um, that people still hold way too many desktop and big screen biases as opposed to hold too many mobile biases. Right? So it's almost the other way around still, despite things like mobile first catching on a little bit here. Because where you see the difference is where you look in parts of the world where people just skip the whole desktop era. And they don't have these types of uh, biases. Right? And they can basically go cashless quickly. And a great example is sort of the aversion we have had to QR codes in the US, whereas in places like China, you use them to give money to a beggar on the street. <laughs> I was like, that's the dichotomy that we have there. Um, and so I feel like sometimes we're almost afraid to go the other way. We're missing out on a bunch of opportunities because we are too worried about like, oh, well, I as a tech worker use desktop all day. And therefore, I have to think about that. But I do believe the right interface should be, hmm, what's a good way of saying this nowadays? I don't even know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I honestly, I, I now have like sort of a mixed view of responsive design. I, to a certain extent, I still really appreciate and think it's the right way to do things just because you want an adaptable interface to work in lots of different screen sizes and things like this, right? But uh, some of the one size fits allness of it has enabled us to hold on to ideas for too long because we were like able to make them work in other places, right? So it kind of served as a crutch for a long time as opposed to kicking us off the cliff um, and forcing us to swim, right? Kind of like a life raft. So I have mixed feelings. I don't know, am I just ranting? Sorry. Yeah. You were gonna say? Yeah. Hi, Luke. Hi. Great presentation. So it was great how you showed the white space and the opportunity space and how divergent thinking is really required there. Uh, as a UX researcher, I'm very curious to know in what ways have you partnered with like UX research to do some of these activities or are currently doing some of these activities? Yeah, too to many find ways. <laughs> some one example maybe, just to... Uh, yeah, we do reference. a lot of stuff. So I, on my team at Google, we have a bunch of researchers and one of the things that I really love is doing right rapid iterative testing and evaluation mm -hmm. because what we do is every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday we work on designs and a prototype every single Thursday we bring human beings in that we put in front of the thing mm -hmm. at the end of the day we figure out what we're going to change we start changing on Friday and we repeat week after week after week and I, I love that process for a lot of reasons one is just this continuous human contact mm -hmm to vet your assumptions and learn. Yeah. B, there's like a regular cadence and a schedule. People are coming, you always have to deliver things. Mm -hmm. um, and then three, the focus on like solving problems because the more you talk to people, the more you understand the problem versus saying, I think we should, yeah. right? And jumping to solutions. So I mean, there's many, many things that stem from that. That's right. one concrete example of how we use research. Mm -hmm. So. Thanks for sharing that. I'm also trying to understand when you say divergent thinking, sometimes right is a great method, but yeah. sometimes maybe you also need to take a step back and work and try to understand, hey, do you know, are, are we doing the right thing? Like, have you done something like that and what has worked? Yeah, like I, pretty much yeah. every day you question whether <laughs> or not you're doing the right thing, right? Right, and then maybe right, something more exploratory might be yeah. Okay. I, having experience. What, what was uh, can't remember what specifically I saw that made me think of this, but I was remembering something around like the notion of how you develop taste. Taste being kind of a definition of what good is, 
you know, well, how do you know this product design is good and this product mm -hmm. design is bad? How do you learn that? Or actually, let me boil it down. How do you know this wine is bad and this wine is good? Mm -hmm. Well, you drink a crap load of wines and then you learn like, oh, yeah, those are pretty bad ones. These are pretty good ones. And so having those experiences, which often comes with getting out into the world, experiencing mm -hmm. it, doing research, helps build taste of what is actually good and what's bad. And until you build that kind of barometer, mm -hmm. you may not have the ability to decide what's right or what's wrong, or maybe you have a limited view of it. Sometimes that's good, right? Naivety can, but that's relying a lot on luck and that type of stuff. Um, Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah. one more question, Luke. Yeah. So uh, in today's like world, which is dominated, where, where everybody's talking about AI, including Google today yeah. heavily, and AI and big data, what is the role of, of an artist, and especially in terms of like, you know, the context you gave where you showed the Facebook example, right? They, they may run experiments in thousands, and then they decide. So, and I've had this discussion with designers, like where is the creative freedom for an artist to, you know, do this versus everything being, because uh, data hungry companies like Google and Facebook where decisions are made based on data, data is making the decisions. Worth. Yeah, so the common kind of like kickback I have to that is being data driven is bad because you don't want data making decisions for you. You want human beings making decisions, right? And saying you're data driven also allows you to be like, well, I didn't do that, the data made me do it, right? The data said this is the best navigation, so well, not my fault. And it sort of absolved people. And I, I believe the more appropriate thing to be is data informed, where data informed allows you to have a perspective. So when you make a decision, which is what humans should do, you are making it from a vantage point that's here as opposed to down here. Right? And if you have no information, no data, then you're trying to make a decision by looking like you know from this little area. The more data informed you are, the broader perspective you see and the more you can feel good about the decisions that you're making. So that's how I would personally think about it, right? But there's, that's a whole different animal than using data to feed computers that can do things better than us. And I frankly, like, I wouldn't want to subject any human to want, looking at 50 million images a day to try to figure out which one's a cat. All right, like, let's make a computer do that. That seems like a fair trade-off. Yeah. Uh, hi, Luke. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one, uh, what's your vision to progressive web apps? Mm -hmm. uh, you as a Google employee uh, yeah. uh, have a lot of thoughts about it, for sure. And the second question is, what is your vision for beacons? I did a search about them like, in my university uh, past year, and everyone was saying uh, about them. And yeah, it didn't pan out, did it? Yeah, I researched a lot about physical web of Google and Scott yeah. Jensen, and what, what are your thought, thoughts about them? Yeah, so Silicon Valley is a machine designed to try things where the intended outcome is that most will fail. <laughs> right? And I think that's generally the approach you should take with all this stuff. Maybe one day beacons will take off, maybe not. But we, we did a bunch of stuff with beacons two years ago. And I was super excited about it and all this stuff. And it, man, when we actually got into using it, it did not turn out very good, right? Um, so unless there's some fundamental issues that we get over there, I'm not necessarily very bullish on it just because I had all this first-hand experience of it being in that kind of like, hey, we tried it. Eh, didn't really work the category. Um, the other question about PWA, that's an example where I think some things actually are working. Because the fundamental notion that we speed up websites and we help them kind of be quicker to load falls in line with exactly the type of stuff that I was talking about earlier, right? Like there's a core need there to make mobile experiences load quickly, be accessible, and that sort of stuff. Uh, all the things PWAs enable you to do are not necessarily all great. Some are experiments and will fail. But uh, the core set of things like making things secure, HTTPS, great. Offline access through a service worker, which makes things fast. Great. Uh, web web uh, manifest file that helps people, you know, kind of put these things on home screens and provides information about the app. Great. 
but those three fundamental things I can stand behind. Some of the others, notifications, and some of the other stuff they're bundling under PWA, we'll see. Unclear. Last question, and before, Last question. hold on, before we get to that one, I want to thank everybody for showing up. We'll see you here again next month, second Tuesday, 7.30, we start the program. And thank you, Ted, for bringing the uh, ball container for the microphone. What fun. Uh, I, I work for an enterprise software company, and to this gentleman's point, like we're designing, like traditionally, a lot of software for desktop. Do you have any advice on how you can influence, like, culture change? for getting an organization to think more mobile. Because uh, our mobile teams are like one-tenth or one-twentieth the size of our web teams. We're okay. always trying to like catch up. But and that then, may, maybe that's appropriate to who's using your software and how. I don't know. Right? Like, should everybody do virtual reality right now? Well, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the, the story around why mobile is important is pretty clear. Right, you can show them a bunch of the data that I showed just to illustrate how broadly distributed these devices are, what the opportunity space is there. But before you go and invest in that opportunity, there should be a clear reason why it makes sense. I personally believe there's usually a really good mobile story, but I could be convinced otherwise. Right? Even in like enterprise, when I had my last startup, we ran the whole thing off of mobile. Right? Like I was out riding bikes and I had an admin thing that we built with responsive web design, which was awesome. And on any device, I could go and like manage all sorts of stuff and just operate the whole business from my phone through this custom stuff we built. It was awesome. Um, and whereas most people would be like, no, you know, that's a worker thing at the office. So I don't know. I don't know what you do, so I can't necessarily say. If you want to convince people Mobile is important. Take all the slides I, should, I had and it should work. <laughs>